I'm Michael Stipe. Uh, I'm a Microsoft MVP and uh, I'm the author or one of the authors now of the uh, Chili Queen Graph uh, platform for .NET. And uh, the Chili Queen Graph platform actually started with the, with the GraphQL server for .NET almost four years ago, uh, which is the hot chocolate GraphQL server. It's today one of the fastest GraphQL servers out there. It's faster than any node GraphQL server and the fastest on the .NET platform. It's also one of the most feature-rich GraphQL servers. Um, but today we are not talking about GraphQL in the backend. We are talking about GraphQL in the front end with, uh, with Microsoft.NET uh, and Blazor. And with Blazor, Microsoft for the first time in years gives us a viable solution to building modern applications that run in the browser. Uh, it's a bit of a reminder of, we had some, uh, some years ago, something that ran in the browser. It was not that good. Uh, it was called Silverlight. And since then, we actually had nothing. We were bent to the backend or to the desktops. And we're talking about Blazor in the context of GraphQL. And GraphQL is uh, not any more the newest of technologies. Actually, um, it was developed or invented internally at, at Facebook in 2012. So it actually is almost 10 years old. Um, but for the public, it was accessible from 2016 on, I would say, 2015, they announced it. And it actually, they uh, Facebook released it as an open source specification. So what is GraphQL? I know a lot of .NET developers uh, still don't know what GraphQL is or have the wrong idea about it. There's often a comparison to OData. Is it, is it Facebook's OData? Uh, spoiler, it's not. And we will learn why it's not. Um, so with GraphQL, Facebook tried to invent a technology that takes, uh, that takes out the friction of um, communicate, uh, communication between your backend and your front end. There's one misconception that uh, GraphQL is actually something out of the JavaScript realm, um, and it is actually not. So GraphQL was originally invented by Facebook back in 2012 to uh, solve their data fetching needs between their native mobile applications and their PHP backend. So it has nothing to do with uh, JavaScript actually. And uh, when they released GraphQL, they actually just released an open source specification. Today, the, uh, the, uh, the um, reference implementation is done in GraphQL, it's GraphQL JS. That is uh, the reference implementation to prove the spec, but it actually came out of uh, a different backend, PHP, and not a, not a JavaScript front end. It was actually Java, uh, Java uh, front ends and uh, native Objective C front ends that tried to better. Okay, let's head into a quick introduction of what GraphQL is, is, how it feels, and what we actually can solve with it. Just a, a little uh, question. If you like what you see and uh, you uh, like the platform in the end, it would be great if you give us a star on GitHub. This is how we pay open source work by starring. It's the smallest contribution you can do to open source. OK, with that, let's get into GraphQL. So this is, uh, I would say, the hello world of GraphQL. It's a very, very small query here. I'm asking for the currently signed in user. And from this currently signed in user, I'm asking for the name. And if I would send that to my GraphQL server, I actually would get a response that closely aligns my request. And that is by design, because GraphQL reverse these responsibilities. It puts the consumer of our endpoint into the driver's seat. So as a consumer, I know what use cases I want to fulfill. I know what component I built. So I know what data I need. So it makes sense to give that person the power to ask for the data 
that he or she needs and wants. As my use cases change, I might want to change uh, my request. So I might drill in into further data. Maybe I want now the uh, profile picture as well for my currently signed in user. So I could drill into the picture, maybe get some details about the picture, like the width, the height, and the URL. And as we maybe already expect, I get again a response that closely aligns uh, my request. It almost looks like the server is filling up my request graph with some data. It's not like that, but it's a good mental picture to start thinking about what GraphQL or how GraphQL works. And also, if we look at that here, we can see it's not about flat data structures. GraphQL is actually about trees of data. And that is great since we can uh, explore data in a much more human friendly way where we can drill into the relations of our data. And this re reduces or could even get entirely rid of things like cascading requests and data waterfalls. And that are actually the problems that we have when we, when we are dealing with mobile applications or web applications as, uh, in particular, because we have um, every request counts, right? And every request that we do to the server makes our applications uh, slower. So giving the server the opportunity to optimize the data fetching and give me all the data that I need at one uh, specific time uh, point in time in one go is, is a good thing and optimizes how our application will perform. So if we send in that again, we get uh, a, a response that closely aligns our request. But we can also see that we introduced here some repetition, like name and last seen. Uh, actually, uh, we have that two times. And me and the friends are actually the same types. So me is a single person or a single user, and friends is a list of users. And GraphQL has a solution for that, which is called a fragment. A fragment is our primitive for composition. It allows us to create fragment hierarchies as we create UI component hierarchies um, or even uh, class hierarchies in our backends. So you can also use GraphQL out of the uh, UI context. So it's very, very great to build front ends. And that's where it comes from, building very efficient front ends and taking the friction out of building the front ends. But uh, it's becoming more and more popular also um, doing uh, data fetching in the backend. So it also makes their sense to build maybe class hierarchies as you build uh, fragment hierarchies. But we will see why fragments are so cool when we do our live coding. So let me sum that a bit up. So with GraphQL, we have one endpoint. Because we don't need all the endpoints that we have with REST or other technologies, since we are crafting the request, we are crafting the interface between our application and our backend. So we need just one endpoint to issue all our requests to that. And we can get all the data that we need at one specific uh, point in time in one request. That doesn't mean we have to fetch all the data in one request, but we can control how much data we actually want to get in one request. And that gets rid of the over or under fetching problem in client applications. Underfetching is actually what causes these cascading uh, requests, these data waterfalls, because uh, my backend developer might have decided that this is a response for a request I issued. This is how the response structure is and have to live with it. And maybe it doesn't serve enough data for me. So I have to do another fetch with some ID that I acquired from the first request. That is what we call underfetching. Uh, and overfetching is also a concern where maybe the, the, the request structure that my backend engineer offered to me uh, always gives me too much data. I don't need all this data. And that's why my mobile application doesn't run so good. And GraphQL is also built 
on a strong type system. And that's also one of the key benefits of GraphQL uh, because it lets me trust the backend. Like uh, many people then say, yeah, we have things like that with Swagger. Swagger has a schema that describes all the types in my backend. Yeah, but it is not, um, it is actually not um, applied. So there's the schema is just an information. There's no query engine that enforces these rules. With GraphQL, if, if GraphQL server tells you that something is a string or an int or is non-nullable, then you can trust that. Because if the backend engineer violates the contract by sending you null for a field that is non-nullable, the server will actually throw an exception and that it will not give you the data. So you can trust what the GraphQL server gives you. And that makes GraphQL very predictable to use. Okay, that is a quick introduction to GraphQL. We will go much deeper today. Let's also, before we go into actually building something with GraphQL and Blazor, head into Blazor and have a look what Blazor actually is. Because Blazor is still the new kit on the block for .NET developers. Um, and specifically, we are looking at Blazor for WebAssembly, and that's really new. So what is Blazor for WebAssembly? I said it runs in the browser. And that's true because Blazor for, web, uh, for WebAssembly actually is .NET running on a WebAssembly. It's a .NET runtime, a mono WebAssembly runtime running in your browser. And that means we are running .NET Core in the browser. We can run all the .NET Core assemblies that we use to um, use throughout our backend experience, like in ASP.NET Core. We can use that now in the browser, like dependency injection, HTTP client factory, uh, configuration, options, APIs, everything that we had and everything that we built ourselves, we can run that in the browser. And that means we can build our front end applications with more .NET and less JavaScript. I'm writing here less JavaScript because you actually can uh, use JavaScript even in your Blazor WebAssembly applications. Um, and that is a good thing because the Blazor um, framework is at the beginning. It was first released with .NET 5 and um, uh, we don't have yet in our ecosystem all the components that the React developer has. But you can just take a JavaScript component, wrap it as a Blazor component, and make it accessible through .NET. And that's a great thing. Blazor runs, because it runs as a WebAssembly at near native performance, it's much faster as if you were using just JavaScript. And WebAssembly is an open standard. It runs in every browser. So every browser has built WebAssembly right into its core. So it, it works um, with every major browser that is out there, apart from Internet Explorer. But to be honest, I think nobody cares about Internet Explorer these days anymore. And one more great thing about Blazor is that it's open source, meaning you can go to the GitHub repository of ASP.NET Core, create feature requests, dive into the code, and um, even commit new features or bug fixes. So how does Blazor work? In order to create Blazor UI components, we are using a combination of C Sharp and Razor syntax. We kind of know Razor. If you've done MVC, for instance, uh, a few while back, you kind of get the concept how to craft these UI components. The Mono runtime is downloaded with our Blazor application into the browser and enables us to run normal .NET code. But fear not, it's not like in, 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 the, in the days of Silverlight, where we run in a, in a proprietary extension that runs in a different security context. Now, WebAssembly runs in a sandbox like all the browser uh, applications that we build in JavaScript. So we, we run in the same security context. A Blazor application always has a shadow DOM. And that's because uh, WebAssembly, app, uh, WebAssembly applications at the moment cannot uh, actively manipulate the DOM. 
Uh, there is a proposal uh, for WebAssembly to gain this ability, but at the moment it's not possible. So what Blazor does is build up an internal component tree that we are actually uh, manipulating with our .NET assemblies. There's a little JavaScript router that is uh, built by Microsoft, so we don't have to write that JavaScript that actually takes all these changes to the internal component tree and patches these to the browser DOM. And also if we interact with the browser DOM, uh, this JavaScript will patch these changes back to the um, internal component representation. And that's how we get all these nice .NET events from our components, although they're actually routed JavaScript events. Before we dive into our demos, let's also have a, have a quick run through the state of Blazor. So as I said, Blazor uh, actually, Blazor for the backend, Blazor server, uh, is already quite battle tested. It shipped originally with .NET Core 3, um, and it can be used at massive scale, but it's still running in the backend. That's why I never got so psyched about it. I wanted to run in the browser, run on the desktop, have something like we have with React, where we can have React Native, we have React in the browser, and we can use it everywhere. In May last year, uh, Microsoft shipped to Blazor for WebAssembly with .NET 5 for the first time as a non-preview. And uh, the concept of Blazor was already validated uh, with the Bla Blazor for server. So the, the concept is um, battle tested. The thing that changed is how we update our component tree, where we have in Blazor uh, server, the ability to manipulate the DOM through JavaScript by using signal R and stuff like that. Uh, with Blazor, we are sitting really in the browser and uh, have a different way to update our component trees. But the concept is the same. And Steve Sanderson actually showed that off that uh, this concept uh, can be swapped out easily by building something called Blutter, which is a Blazor which produces Flutter components. But uh, .NET does not stop there. So there are Blazor web application and Electron previews that also came with .NET 5. And uh, now when we look at .NET 6, we can see that Blazor is spreading everywhere. It will run on the browser as, as an application. You can uh, run it as a Blazor island in your uh, WPF applications even. Uh, and you can, you can kind of run it everywhere now. So if you start with Blazor, it's not only for a browser application, you take, can take your knowledge acquired there and transfer it to building browser or mobile application. So it's a great, uh, great framework that is at the beginning and it's the right time to get in on the fun. But that's enough about all the talking. I think we now have the foundation. We know uh, a bit about GraphQL. And, uh, still a little bit, but we will dive in deep. And we know something about Blazor. So let's put that to use by doing a little demo. The first demo I will actually not do in Blazor. We will build a standard console application just to get an idea of how GraphQL in .NET can work. So before we do anything, we actually go into our GraphQL IDE. This is actually banana cake pop. We have lots of uh, fruity and uh, cakey names. Uh, it's our GraphQL IDE also built by our project. And it's great to get an idea about our API. So we are using the, our workshop front end. So we actually have a big example um, built with our platform. And uh, that is a conference app. It uses the data of the NSC Sydney, uh, and you can build a conference app with it. So a great, uh, I said uh, GraphQL is actually great for a front-end developer to explore or for the consumer to explore. And uh, GraphQL IDE is the right place to get right into it. So I'm connected to our GraphQL backend here. And uh, I can now in Banana K-Pop go on this schema tab and have a look at my um, API, the possibilities I can do. So I can already see that I kind of have 
Here are these three root types, we call them in GraphQL, or operation types. And I have here a query, a mutation in subscription. So a query is everything that we can, uh, that, that we can query. It's side effect free reads onto our backend. A mutation is everything that has side effects on our backend. We change something in our backend. And subscription are kind of our events. So this is real time data. So let's just have a look at our uh, query. What we want to do at our first demo is um, get a list of sessions. So uh, essentially just get a list of titles of our sessions and display them on the console. So we can see that we have here a session field and the session field has some inputs. So I can get the uh, first 10 sessions or I can get the last 10 sessions or I can filter on the sessions or can do a sorting on the session. And uh, when I dive into the, to the session, I get uh, edges, nodes, and uh, page info. Page info gives me an idea of if there's next paging and stuff like that. So essentially it's paging information. The nodes are actually the sessions. We get go uh, more into the structure of this particular node later. So let's do a simple GraphQL query because GraphQL is very simple. So in order to write a query, I can do something like this. I start with query, that's my keyword. And then I can say, get sessions. And this is a name I can choose. That is how I call my operation. Think of it as if you're crafting methods here. So I'm crafting my message, get sessions. As I said, as a GraphQL consumer, we are crafting the, the interface between the backend and us. So now I can specify what data I need, for instance, I want all the sessions. And I'm just, uh, I'm not providing any arguments here. I'm just uh, diving into the data. And then I can get for nodes. And maybe I want the title. But as we've seen already in the first examples, I could also dive in, like go and look at the speakers. And uh, what spe what's the speaker name? And actually maybe what other sessions does the speaker have? Uh, and maybe is this, this speaker in the other sessions talking even together with other speakers? You can get the idea. I can drill into my data and explore it. And, and if I run that, the server will just give me the data as I demand. Like I get the, the titles here and the speakers. At this point, I just have single speakers. Okay, so let's put that into .NET. For that, we are going to Windows. It's the only Windows demo I'm doing today. Uh, the rest we will do on macOS, but let's dive into Visual Studio. We'll actually use a couple of IDs today. Okay, so I'm just saying I want to create a new uh, console application. We're going in here, uh, let's tell, call it get sessions console. So it was .NET 5. You can also do it with .NET Core. And you can use Strawberry Shake even uh, with WPF if you wrap it into a .NET standard uh, application. So it, uh, all the generated clients are actually compatible up to .NET standard and C Sharp 8 uh, or down to C Sharp 8. <laughs> okay, so I have a simple console application here and I have um, my, uh, um, my project structure here. So we actually built a, a GraphQL integration for Visual Studio, which is still preview, but already makes your life easier. So in order to add a GraphQL client, you just go here at GraphQL client, you get this window. And then we actually can paste in our GraphQL URI into here. And then we call it a conference, conference client. And maybe we put it in a separate folder and say, okay. So the integration will get the packages that we need to um, generate all the stuff that we need. It ha has put my GraphQL client into here. 
and also put the, configura uh, the configuration file into here. So in order to write a GraphQL query now in Visual Studio, we just add a new file. And that's actually one thing, a thing of the preview that we haven't yet uh, put in. So there is no GraphQL file template. So we have to say, we use a text template and then say, we want to write a get sessions operation, call it GraphQL. And then we also have IntelliSense now, like in the in, in Banana Cake Pop, we can type query get sessions. And you already see uh, the compiler is kicking in. This is not a string, this is compiled. And uh, this is compiled by Roslyn. So we integrated this as a source generator. So now we have all the fields that we actually had in our GraphQL ID also here. We have the IntelliSense, we can just drill in. So we want sessions. And I said, we do a simple um, a list of the titles. So we just drill into the session, the titles, save that, go to our program CS here. We actually need one more thing, but two more things. Okay, that's compiling. Let's just hand over here. I need um, two more packages. So that this is working. And this is actually, we need some dependency injection logic. So we just grab Microsoft dot extensions. Dependency injection out oh, there. It was, okay, it was right there. No, I misspelled that. Okay. Dependency injection. Sorry for that. Ah, okay. So we take dependency injection. Let me have a look at. Okay, we have the dependency injection HTTP. We have the HTTP transport protocol already in here because that actually was provided by uh, the initial graph uh, plugin. Okay, let's compile. And now we see already here a generated folder. And this generated folder is just the ejected code. So source generators are great. So actually we are injecting the code right into Roslyn. But uh, so that you can actually explore what we are generating, we are putting this C sharp file here. It's actually not compiled, it, it does nothing. It's excluded from the compile process, but just so you can explore and debug into it more easily with source generators. Okay, so how can we use this client? We actually um, spin up our dependency injection. So we have a service collection here and say a new service, service collection. Let's take that. Sorry, I'm not used to Visual Studio. That's why I'm a bit slower here. So um, the uh, integration, the strawberry shake integration already generates for us the um, dependency injection configuration. So I just have to say at conference client because that is what I gave as a name to my client. And in this case, we are using uh, HTTP transport. With uh, GraphQL, you can actually use multiple transport protocols and we are using WebSockets later on. So at this point, I'm using um, just simple HTTP because we are only fetching data. And um, beneath this extension method actually sits the Microsoft um, HTTP client factory. Uh, so I cannot just pass in the configuration for that. So I'm saying base address is equals new UI. And then I pass in in a minute my UI from my backend. Um, and then I'm done. I can use my client. So I'm just doing building my um, service provider here. Then we get the, uh, the uh, conference client out of there. And then we are good to go. So we have our client. Sorry to interrupt, Michael. Would you mind yeah. um, upping the font size to about one hundred and twenty-five percent, just a little bit? That's all. It's, it's probably it's my screen's not great. <laughs> no, no, Excellent. that's Thank good. You. That's good. 
I actually checked the, the, the code size for my later demos, but I didn't uh, check the size for uh, Windows. Sorry for that. So now we have here the conference client. I got it out of my dependency injection. So in, in, in the console, uh, we actually don't have dependency injection, but in, in if you are working with your client in Blazor or in, uh, in uh, some other backend context, then you always have a dependency injection container. So it's very easy. You just say at conference client and it's there. Uh, and we will see that in the next demo. Um, so now let's just, just put a simple for each in. So we do, we fetch from our client here, by client dot. We get the get sessions. We actually need to execute that. So var result. Um, and we execute our query. And okay, I could make it async. It's a demo, so forgive me. Uh, we just take the result. Uh, this is one of our sessions here and uh, our result. So our result from our result data, we just take the sessions, the nodes, and then we print that quickly to our console. So as I said, very, very simple demo. Let's run that just to verify it works. Oh, it won't work uh, because I didn't put the URI in. So I will get an error. Let's sh shortcut that. Let me grab that and then we are going into some more some substantial concepts. Sorry. Windows has different shortcuts. Okay. Again, let's run that. Okay, and I just realized it will just flash out the things and close. Yeah, you can see, and it's done. So that is a very simple context, a concept. It, essentially, we built a glorified HTTP client here because we just have a, a nice uh, data structure now here and we just fetched. But that is actually not what GraphQL clients are about uh, in the modern world. It, it just shows you, you can get started with it very quickly and start on a low, um, with low entry barriers to it. Okay, let's get rid of Windows. and go back to my slides. Awesome, we built our first GraphQL client. It, it was not, uh, not that awesome, uh, but it gives, you an, it, gives, it gives you the idea how it actually can work. So we crafted our GraphQL query. We had full IntelliSense, it, everything compiled. So if you did something wrong, there's no magic strings involved in here. But actually modern GraphQL clients are not glorified HTTP clients. They have more to do with state management clients. And that's actually also what Strawberry Shake does. So when one of those responses comes into our uh, client, we actually normalize the data that comes in, the data tree is normalized into entities. So if we, for instance, fetched people, uh, people then we would normalize that to a person entity. And these person entities are put into an entity store. And the entity store is an in-memory store concept. If you look at uh, other client frameworks in JavaScript realms, we have concepts around Redux, uh, Apollo client, uh, Relay client, which all have these store concepts. And it's a bit overwhelming at the beginning, but you will see in a bit that it's uh, actually pretty simple and will reduce the amount of code that you even have to write to uh, achieve very interactive and reactive clients. So a response is normalized into entities and results. And each of them are stored in separate stores. Strawberry Shake has two stores for entities and for operation results. The operation results are actually composed out of the entities. So when we use our generated client, then we are actually not fetching from, from the backend. We're actually fetching from the operation store. And the operation store will then, if it doesn't have the data at this moment of time, 
It could already have the data. Uh, it goes then to the backend and acquires it. But it doesn't have necessarily, necessarily go to the backend. It could also get it from the file system. It could get it from other sources. You even could combine data sources with it. So when the operation store essentially acquired uh, the data, uh, the the re response is normalized, as we saw, put into the entity store, and then we crafting from the entity store the actual uh, the actual operation result. At the end, our generated client that we are using is notified, and we get the data. So let's get into proper Blazor now. Let me also close this for a second, and then we get into a proper demo. Okay, let me get Visual Studio Code. Close that all. Okay, that is a Blazor application. Just, give me, let, just let me give you a run through it, uh, because I already set a couple of things up here. So you can already see the GraphQL files. So I already started the initialization. So what we did in Visual Studio, I did to that application. So that means I have the schema, I have the uh, schema extension file here, I have the configuration file for GraphQL. And this, in this instance, it's at the root level. Um, then a Blazor application, like any .NET application, starts with the program CS. And uh, that makes it also very simple to understand a Blazor application. Is the font size OK? Or should I not notch it up? OK. Just give me a ping if it's too small. Um, so like in ASP.NET Core, we have in our main method here a builder. In this instance, we have a WebAssembly host builder that uh, host a component instead of middlewares or something like that. We, we are hosting components. And then I have dependency injection. In this instance, I have some arbitrary injection of a client here. We actually don't need that. So let's get rid of that. But it's good to know that we have dependency injection. So what we are building first is actually what we built in the console. We want for our conference application, web application, we want to build um, uh, build a web page where we can see all the sessions that are up now and then page maybe through these these uh, sessions not only have the first 10 just page through them okay in order to do that let's start with graphql again so we uh, do a get sessions again get sessions.graphql and then we start writing our graphql query so query get sessions Again, we have full IntelliSense here. So it's not a magic string. We can actually dive into that. Um, so just let's get the data as we had it before, title. But we also, in this instance, want the ID. And now we want to be able to page through that. That's why we need to uh, have an information about if there is a next page and stuff like that. So we are going into the paging info here from our, uh, sorry, page info from our backend. And we are selecting the um, end cursor of our result set. So that's the last cursor of our result set that we just acquired. So uh, from our page. And also we want to know if there is a next page. Okay, in order to page now through that thing, we need to pass in an after cursor. So uh, essentially, we will take this cursor, pass this into after, and then get the next page. A very simple concept. In order to do that, GraphQL has something that they call variables. So I can uh, define here my GraphQL method, a variable. I call it now after. And it's a string. And this exclamation mark means it's a non-nullable string. I can take that and pass it in. And uh, an analogy to .NET is that I actually have now a method, the get session method, in which I have an, a parameter after that I pass in. And then this is executed on the backend and sent back to me. OK, with this, I actually should be able to compile that. And then we get some types. 
So we are actually also working on design time compilation uh, in our early previews of the next version. As you type your GraphQL, it, it already has generated everything. Okay, but uh, our generator already kicked in. A source generator has uh, injected everything into Ruslan and we now can just say builder dot, sometimes it's uh, a bit slow, but ah, that, just I have a snippet for that. Uh, conference right. Okay, let me just reload. Sometimes uh, Visual Studio Code doesn't like. Ah, okay. So I reloaded it. Sometimes it needs reload. OmniSharper sometimes just decides not to work anymore. Okay. So now we have our dependency injection like we had in our uh, client application. So at conference, we have the same level now as with our uh, console application. So let's dive into some Blazor concepts here. So we want to build a, a list component where we display all our session list. So we go to components, we create a new Razor component. Maybe we call it session list dot Razor. And then we need to put some data logic in. So best to put a code area here in here. And I follow actually more the relay style, uh, the um, React style, in order I put the code above where you define all the state logic for Blazor, which kind of seems better to read the, uh, read the components. Even for people that work in JavaScript, it's easier to read. Okay, so let's put in uh, some parameters that we want to pass in, like the session list. And actually, let me do one correction here. So we talked about fragments in the beginning, and fragments uh, are actually our primitive for composition. And that's what we want to pass into components. So in my component session list, I actually want to pass a list of session infos. So I can now go here and say a fragment. I want to create a fragment session info on session. And then uh, instead of, instead of uh, putting these fields up there, I will copy them down here and then just reference this fragment up here. Okay, let's recompile and go in back into our component. And now let's put in the actual parameters. I hope that okay. So, so what we pass in here is the session list, the list of sessions, and is specifically we are putting in a list of session infos. Okay, so when that is passed in the session, the session infos, we actually want to render something. So that's what we are going to do down here. We are introducing. We are, ah, that is not good here. It's popping up all the time. OmniSharp not happy with me. Okay, so we are passing in the sessions here. Then we have here our uh, markup language. So if we have some sessions, if that is set, we actually want to render something. So we are putting here our HTML, our uh, UL for list of sessions. And then we actually can put in our session item. That's very simple, an LE tag. And then we uh, just put out the title of our session. And that's it for our component. We actually did everything so that we can render sessions. Now we need to uh, set up our page. So we are going to our index page here. And um, when we see that you're running Blazor, we actually not only are generating the client for you, we will also generate Razor components for you. And that is so you can uh, use composition to build these uh, interaction between the data of the store and the backend uh, in a much easier way. So when we look at the generated code, we can see that is the client. And then we have here our components. 
So for each interaction that I have with my backend, I can now introduce a component here. So we should actually, you can see demo components, get session renderer. Before we put that in here, let's go to our imports. So I don't get these long strings there and put in a demo2.components. Okay, let's go back to our page. And then we say, get session renderer. And our get session render has actually two areas. So we have content. I don't know why he tries to put in that. Oh no, content. Okay. So the content area is actually what we want to render when we have data. There are three other cases that we could render like error. So that's, uh, that's actually when we have an error like maybe the, um, the backend went, went down, we don't have a connection to the backend, then we could render this error section here. And there is also a section loading. That's why we acquire the data. So let's get rid of error. We are not building an error page here, but maybe we want to show loading while we are loading the data. And then in the content area, we actually just uh, take our session list then uh, we want to pass in the sessions. That is the parameter. Let, let's put that here. So you can see we have here the sessions list. And then we can just ask for the context of our component. I think we have to switch to my other Visual Studio Code instance because that is not fun. Okay. Let's try that. So we put in our session list, we passed in the context, and this is actually a context that is produced by this component here. Let's run our component and see if that works out. Okay, sorry for that. We are swapping IDs. Might be that this is a preview uh, built. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Actually, um, a fun fact here is that at the moment, uh, and I hope it's getting better, at the moment, the best IDE to, to write Blazor applications is Rider. Ah, and we, we also forgot here to put in a for each statement. That's my session and sessions. I have to go down there. That's good. Okay, now let's go to our page here and we can see that uh, there is something wrong with our data structure, but context was correct. Ah, actually it's this. Okay, so, but everything I told you was correct. Just this uh, little mistake with the, with the ID. Watch. And we are starting now our application with .NET Watch. It's actually uh, .NET 6, so we should get our data quickly. Let's see that in our Edge browser. And I already saw there is, there is a mistake at the moment. We have one error. So let's look at the uh, developer tools. Uh, unheld render component value cannot be null. Ah, I know what it is. So we uh, crafted this, this request here. And you can see here, we have also have IntelliSense in Rider. So, um, but in our instance here, this is uh, non-nullable, but it has to be nullable. 
because we are creating uh, when we are at the first page of our data, we actually uh, have no cursor. Okay, let's see. That should be up again. And that is a hot reload. It's already reloaded and we can see our component is done. So we actually did no code so far, not real code. We just wrote some markup. We have a list. Let me run you through uh, again. So we have this composition approach here where we can say we need to get session renderer. And this get session renderer will interact with the store and do all the things that we have to do to get the data. And then we are passing the data to our components. And the concept here in SPA applications is that we have smart components at the top that actually interact with the store, with backend and stuff like that. And then they are pushing down the data, the component tree. The components, uh, uh, the, the dumb components in our component tree can then interact with events with our data or with the outer components to do something. So the next thing is actually that we want to do is to make it page. So how do we make it page? Uh, we actually need some more state. So we need state for our after cursor. So we put in some state here, a string, let's call it after. And then um, as, oh, no, let's put it as a parameter, much nicer. So we put a string in, that is our after cursor that we want to have. Totally wrong. Wrong spot. You want to be here. So we actually, sorry, we actually have here an after cursor and we need some component state in our outer component. Let me just grab that. So this is our after cursor. We're putting that in here. So this is now bound to our renderer. It will pass in. So each argument that we have, uh, we can pass in here as an argument. And now we need just a little button that we can place in our content area down here where we can uh, essentially click next. And next, we'll grab from our context the end cursor and assign it to the after uh, to the after state. This is our component state. And then we have paging, two lines of code. It's recompiling. It's there. We have our next button here. And now we can page through our data. It's very simple. We could do that also um, to do it reverse. Um, but I mean, it was very quick. So, but there's one additional problem we have. I talked about store and state management and let's make sense how, how that plays into that. So if I, at the moment go here to the counter page and now, now look, now look, uh, on this side. So I'm here, there is nothing yet. So I don't have a page here, but, uh, there's nothing in our console output. But as soon as I go back here to home, you see it's fetching data. And I'm going back here. It's fetching data. Um, and that is uh, actually unnecessary because we uh, should be able to um, just, key, just reuse our old data. So when we go back to our component here, we can pass in a strategy how we actually interact with data. And we can tell our, uh, tell our component to use a cache first approach. And that means we will first look at our stores, get the data from there. If the data that we are requesting is not there, we will actually go to the backend and get that. Okay, just let me put in another page here a component uh, page in this case and that is the uh, how do we call it uh, sessions laser okay and let's just um, 
put in some menu items. So where we have counter, we actually put the sessions here. It's just that we don't get an error anymore. And then it should already be render. And then we can see how our site changed. Okay, we have sessions here. Um, we can swap and you can see it's not actually not um, fetching any new data anymore. If I refresh my application, it fetches data. Here you can see it's going to the backend, fetching data. But if I now go back, it's not fetching data. But look now, if I page through here, it actually fetches for each page a new, new, new data. So now I go back to my session. I go back to the home page, and now I start paging, and it actually has the pages already. So we have no additional interaction with our backend. Okay, so that is how state management actually starts to working, but there's more to it. Let's let's maybe put something in to manipulate uh, how we interact with data. So we want to maybe edit our session. So let's go to our session list component first and uh, put some eventing in so that we, that we actually can start editing data. So for this, I'm putting in two uh, new parameters here. And these new parameters is actually an event when I click on one of these sessions and uh, a parameter that indicates if I want to have an editable list. Depending on if I want an editable list or not, I want to render a different list item. So one time with a, a edit button and one time not with an edit button. With that, my component is again finished. And that's good. I have dumb testable components. Okay, so next thing, we need an edit component, something where we can rename our session. So we are adding a component here, rename session, uh, Razor. It's our, uh, I would say, second dump component. <laughs> Let's get rid of this. And this component uh, is a data component. And the data component is, uh, a component that uh, uh, has knowledge about uh, some of our GraphQL requests. And I already put in here rename, rename session mutation. We actually have to create a new GraphQL file that defines now this session mutation. So rename session. I put in a new GraphQL file. Let's put it in the root. It doesn't have to be in the root, actually. We could leave it up there. We could put it in. Uh, we could actually put each GraphQL file to the component that handles it. Or, uh, yeah, you're free to organize however you want. So what we now do, and I'm copying that over so I, I don't bore you with typing. Uh, we now have a rename uh, session mutation. And the crucial thing here is that we actually let me look for the for this file and put it side to side. We are using the the fragment that we already used here. So we want to get back when we when we rename a session. We want to read the data from the server again, and uh, get actually the date the data in the same shape as our uh, sessions component. Okay, with that, we can compile and should be able to. Um, now use our data component here. And that means we can uh, define now the state that we need to edit our session. And for that, we actually need uh, a title. That is what we are editing. We will bind this field to some components and uh, the session that we want to edit. Let me just put some more code in. The second here is that we want to uh, pass in the session. So dumb component, we put the session in, the session object. It's a session info again. We put that in. And then we have here a, a method that, when triggered, will save the, the session and will actually uh, trigger an event 
trigger an event that the that the session is actually renamed, or maybe it's aborted, then we don't raise this, this event. So as I said, data down the component tree uh, events will be thrown. Okay, let me put some markup in. That is actually just the code for our component. And then we put in the markup. So if we have a session, we render. If there's a session passed in, we will render. And uh, then we render here this edit session uh, header. We re render an input. We have a, button, a save and a cancel button. So very, very easy. It takes it, so the, the strawberry shake takes all the complexity away from fetching data. We actually define just these dumb components and we put everything else um, in there. So now we just put our rename session. We compose now a new page where we can have this editable list and where we use our components. So I already created this new page, sessions. And we can uh, call it edit sessions. That is actually our H1. Let's put that down here. And then like in the other component, we actually can copy that over from our index page. So we actually could start with the same list that we have in here. Um, yeah, we could also copy over the the, the state, we have the same component state, uh, the same after cursor. But in our case, we actually want to allow to select components and with that edit components. The second thing is we want, uh, when we click on a component, in that instance, uh, we want to, we want to set a component state. And that means we need uh, one more field here. So one more state field in our component, which is called selected session. And when we click onto our, uh, onto our one of those um, sessions in the list, we actually want to raise our event here and set our state that we have on our component. So when we raise that, we the session we selected will be Add it to the selected session to our field up there. So that we can then use in our rename session component that we just written. Oh, which I renamed very oddly. Let me just fix that up. Add it, rename. Rename sessions up. Okay, so now we have the rename session. We pass in the selected session. So we bind this component also to this field. And when we uh, are done with editing, so when we did save the session, we actually set this component, uh, this component state to none. So let's run that. Again, we almost have zero code here. We just compose. So we refresh. This is our simple list. We can page through it. You can see uh, we are doing backend uh, interaction. So now I go to this. And you can see there's no backend interaction because this component knows this data is already fetched. So we are getting it from the store. So now I can go here and there. I have no backend interaction. Here I have an editable state. But I also can page here and it takes the same state. Okay. Now I want to edit this field, different components. I just click on here, edit. This is a complete different request now. This will do a request to the backend, but it will update all the state where this particular data piece is used everywhere in my component. So this is automatically updated. I didn't write the code for updating it. That is all done by a strawberry shake in the store because the store actually is, is an observable concept. So everything is reactive, everything interacts. So if I, so, um, so strawberry shake knows where you use which piece of data uh, in which component and will update that everywhere. Okay, uh, this is uh, nice. Now let's put 
some real-time uh, functionality in that. We, at the moment, have two operations. We fetch sessions, we update sessions, so query and mutation, we did that. Now let's um, do some more significant stuff and put in some real-time data. And um, maybe our conference app has an, a social area where people can send in messages. And uh, we want to display when you come here, uh, maybe the five newest messages that uh, people wrote, like, uh, like kind of they can do comments about the, the, the whole uh, conference that we are hosting. OK, so for that, let's go back into here. And let's build another component. And uh, this is, again, a data component. Um, so it's not one of those no-code components. So we are creating a new wrong folder at laser component. Uh, let's call it our message, uh, message view. I don't know. OK. So and the second thing we need is to craft a real-time operation. So we add a new GraphQL file, and we call it on message received. So every time a user makes a comment, uh, we actually get that comment in real time. And a real time uh, uh, operation in GraphQL is called a subscription. So we start with the keyword subscription and say on uh, message received. Uh, and then we want when a message is received, for instance, then we want to get maybe the body and the ID of the message that was received. Very simple. But we also kind of don't like this field name here. And there's uh, one more concept in GraphQL, which is called an alias. So we could say, actually, in .NET, we want this to be called a message. In GraphQL, this is the event name, makes sense. But from a data consumption point, this is actually a message. So we we call that a message. Now we just compile that. And that uh, will generate uh, our code here. And we can go now to our message view and then say add data component, then uh, say uh, on message received subscription. Did it compile? Where did I put it? Yeah, it should be. Let me look at the code. Do we have it? Yeah, it should be there. Let's go back to our component. Ah, sorry. Everything is all right. Um, I have to say inherit here. OK, so I'm inheriting from the data component. So all the data handling stuff is done for me. So now um, I actually want to display only the last five uh, comments that uh, users did so we don't uh, use up all the space. So we are kind of doing a list here, a list of strings. And that is that are our messages that we receive. We're just doing a new. And now that works. The, uh, sec is the second thing here is uh, when the component initializes, then we want to subscribe to our backend and start receiving data. So we are doing a protected void on initialize. So when our component initializes on init, uh, protected override, sorry. Uh, when our component initializes, we are grabbing the data. So we do a subscribe. And that comes from our data component. We can subscribe to data and can just say uh, that is our operation here. And then we do uh, a watch. We watch what is coming, uh, what is coming. So we are observing here. And maybe we um, can already say, okay, 
we just we just want the results that uh, actually are success results. If there is some transport error, we don't care in our demo about that. Um, and maybe we also want to uh, reduce our data a bit. So we take the result. Say actually it doesn't come in quite the right structure for us. So we take in the message, and here you see the message that I actually renamed is now renamed here to message. If I didn't do the alias in my request, it would be called on message received. Okay, so, and then we just, maybe we're just uh, caring about the body. Uh, so we are reducing our set to that. And last we say now subscribe. This is the message or the body. And uh, now we can do the logic to add the message to our body, uh, to our list. Maybe we do an insert. The top message should be at the top. And uh, then we just uh, check if there are too many messages, maybe um, if there are more messages than five, uh, we just remove the last. Remove messages. Okay, that's good. And it's guaranteed that this uh, is really the, the, the messages actually, uh, there is a queue behind that. So you will get one after the other. So you don't have to have any synchronization logic here. We will give you a message after you're done with them so that you get the next. Okay, with that, our state again is ready. All our code is done. Uh, let's uh, do a little list maybe. What did we take here? Was it an uh, H2? And we call that maybe we only show that actually if we have messages, messages count bigger zero, then we want to display our markup. Uh, and we show that uh, what's, what's new. I don't care what's new. Uh, something. I'm not that creative, so let's leave it by that. And then we do a list again, an unbounded list. Well, okay, that looks good. And then we do a, a simple for each, for each over our data, this is our message in messages. And that's straightforward.net. And then we just print our L E and the message here at message. I totally prepared my uh, Visual Studio Code uh, ID today to have these templates and stuff. Uh, and now I have to type it anyway because it completely let me down today. Okay, so that looks good. What is he complaining about? Let's compile that, see what the fuss is about, but this should be all right. Okay, that's our real-time component. It uh, works now. We have here our, um, our markup. It produces all the messages. Now we can actually use that. So let's go to our index page and maybe just uh, print over here, we use that component. This is a self-sufficient component, it's a data component. We don't need to use it uh, in, the, in this sense. So it, it, it doesn't have to be composed into the get sessions renderer. We could do that. Maybe we just want to show that when get sessions is run. But this is a real-time component. So we are showing it actually above. So we say message view. And then we should see that. That should already be compiled. Let's have a look. No, it doesn't. And that's also correct because what we didn't do so far is set up a real-time uh, real protocol. So when we use GraphQL subscriptions, we actually need to configure WebSockets here. WebSockets, gRPC, whatever you can use for streaming. Uh, 
So we are using WebSockets here. So we do configure WebSockets. And we made that super simple. So these extension met methods allow you to configure every client in the same way. So we just do configure WebSockets. And that's actually, just let me give you one more thing and I'm hurrying along. No. So we already put here the transport WebSockets protocol in. Each protocol has its own package so that you don't carry all the protocols around. So you have to add the packages to get these extension method methods. And then you also have the, the transport and only then will the source generator also generate real time code. Okay, so what we are doing here is uh, saying, okay, our client actually needs a URI. We can grab the one up here. Okay, uh, it's not HTTPS, it's uh, now because it's uh, WebSockets, it's a WSS for a secure WebSocket. Okay. So now my uh, console, uh, my application should compile again. We should get up and running and you can already see it doesn't have errors. I really love this quick reload now with um, at the new.net watching.net 6. Okay, so we fetch data. Uh, we actually can uh, go through here. But how do we get uh, real-time data in here? And you can help me because you can go to that uh, address and then you can uh, just post messages in right into my debug session here. And I give everybody uh, some time. Also getting my client up. Okay. Go back. That didn't work. Why not? But I can see it here in my console. Hello. Let's see why it didn't work. Did I use the right component? Let's refresh that. Very disappointing. Ah, it, it did actually work, but I did one mistake. This is a reactive component here, sorry. And uh, we actually have to tell, tell um, Blazor that we, have, uh, that we are finished, that we have new data to render. There's a Blazor function that is called state has changed. And this will trigger the render. Let's just restart that and try that again. Uh, okay, let's refresh that. And now start again. Let's try that. Yeah, and you can see here what's new. Yeah, that's cool. So it works. Somebody's, uh, I didn't have uh, all the encoding stuff in there. So maybe I don't get the right icons, but that's very cool. Uh, JetBrains license. I think this user group uh, has a sponsorship with JetBrains. So maybe they have licenses uh, in a toss up. Okay, so that is real time. So what we did, and we are not finished. I have one more little demo left that uh, runs all of this up. So we did simple fetches, we did mutations, we did reactive data where all the components automatically uh, interact with, uh, um, with each other. Uh, and we saw that we wrote almost no code. And this is true not only for Blazor, it's also true for WPF or other um, .NET frameworks where you can use that. Okay, so let's go uh, into the next topic. And that's the last topic that we have. It's persistence. Um, why persistence? So we are building these reactive applications that are really awesome, uh, have these, uh, these in-memory store concept, um, are re real-time, are reactive, awesome. But actually with this uh, store concepts, we uh, can serialize these store snapshots and then uh, write offline applications um, by essentially observing our entity and operation store and saving these uh, snapshots to our, to our data stores. Um, all of these store snapshots are serializable and uh, can be persisted. And that actually works out of the box. Um, we have a... Uh, 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 um, uh, already providers for SQLite, for instance, we are working on a provider for IndexedDB. So you just plug them in and you have persisted data. And that means 
when your application uh, comes up and you are sitting on an airplane, we actually can uh, still give you all the data that you used because we just take our uh, persistence layer, load it into the store. You can interact with the store. You can do optimistic mutations. And when you go back online, we just uh, replay all those mutations again at the back. So let's have a look at that. Um, and actually, so just in the defense of VS Code, uh, it was the insider preview. I use Visual Studio Code on a daily basis. So most of Hot Chocolate and Strawberry Shake is actually written in VS Code. And, um, and uh, it's quite reliable. It has some issues, but not like today, but I don't care. In the end, I have so many IDEs to test this stuff on. <laughs> so we could even use uh, Visual Studio for Mac. Uh, OK, let's go to the third demo. OK, that's the inside preview. That didn't work out for us. Let's use uh, the release version of Visual Studio Code, which doesn't work yet, but we make it. So we say that. And if you hear my daughter in the back end crying, she had a bad dream, I heard. I have three of these kids and yeah, you always, you always have something new. <laughs> okay, so this is again a console application just to uh, show the show off how persistence works. It works in the browser, it works uh, with um, Xamarin applications. And actually, if you, if you think about Xamarin applications, they are the perfect uh, target for that. Because when I have my mobile application, as I said, sit in the in the in the in the airplane. I want to access my data. I know I cannot get new data, but I want to access the data that I have. Okay. So my application here is uh, set up at the moment uh, with the conference app, like we had in the other demos. Uh, I have. Uh, in a memory client that I don't need at the moment. We have lots of transports, so, uh, but we don't need the memory. We just use the HTTP client for simple fetches. And just to show you here, uh, in this case, we have the request in the folder, so you can really put them anywhere you want. Um, and what we are going to do is just fetching the, the ID and the title. And um, in this instance, I have plugged in a log message handler, and that is a delegated uh, delegation handler for the H uh, HTTP client that will print out uh, when we actually do HTTP requests. So we see that it interacts against the backend. So if I just start that at the moment, it uh, will create a client. It will go to the backend, fetch here, and print out our data. Let's have a look at the code. It's very simple. Yeah, you see it, it creates the configuration that I showed you. Then it subscribes to the store. And this is not the, uh, in the first example, we saw this uh, get sessions execute. Here we are actually using the uh, reactive way. We are watching the store uh, and then we are printing it out almost like a subscription, but this is not a subscription. We are just subscribing to the store, as I mentioned. Okay, so that works out. We fetched, we display. So when we want to put in uh, um, a persistence, we just say add persistence here, add SQL persistence. And I can only do that because I actually uh, have the uh, story shake persistence package in here for SQLite. And that means I just provide an SQLite connection string and then the store will automatically persist. Now everything I do against the memory store to my uh, SQLite store. And there's more, we, we have to do one more thing um, because we uh, have to initialize the persistence so that it starts watching our store. So uh, get persistence, 
Let me just put that in here. So I'm getting the persistence service here. And in this uh, instance, I'm doing uh, initialize async. I could also do a begin initialize and I immediately have control back, but we want to make sure that uh, we actually got the data. So we await that. And this will look if there is a database, then it will load, then it will pre-fill the store with the data that we acquired earlier. So now I do another pre-run. It will actually have the same be behavior as before. You can see we do the H uh, the HTTP call and then we uh, get the data. There's one more caveat to that. We actually have to tell our store now to use a different strategy. Our strategy now should be um, that we use cache first. Let's yet let's use cache first. And that means we will first look in the store, which is pre-filled from our database that you can see here now, and then, uh, then print the data. So my application is coming up. And we don't have any HTTP call like here. It's just local data. And as you see, when we when we would have paged through that, we actually would have all the pages in here. So we can get a lot of data into there. Okay, so second, second thing, there's another strategy. I could also like in this offline online applications where I have a Xamarin application that maybe is offline, maybe online, I could use a different strategy. I could say uh, I use a cache and network. That means First, let's look at the net. Uh, let's look at the cache. So uh, let, let's look at the store. Get the data from there, and then we try to get the get fresh data from our backend. If there is fresh data, we will trigger this subscribe again, meaning uh, uh, we would be triggered a second time. So let's try that out. We actually. Uh, you can see we get the data printed, then here's our HTTP call. There is no new data, so we get just triggered once. But we have this great application that we built earlier. Let's run that for a second. Now we manipulate one of the, uh, this, hey, Mycroft, let's manipulate that. Then see uh, how that hey, Mycroft. Let's find that. There. Oh, wrong thing. Hey, Mycroft. Yeah. We go here. We edit that. One, two, three. Safe. So this is saved. Mycroft. One, two, three. Uh, now we go back here. We run our application again. It will get the uh, state from the store here, but it now sees that on the back end is a change, and then it will pull in the change data. So we'll only uh, update your um, call here, your subscribe call, when the data is really changed. And it will look at every field to uh, determine that. Okay, so there is one more, and then we're done. Um, You can also, I talked about uh, um, state manipulation. So you can also do local state manipulation. Like we could actually uh, get access to the store. Like so, we just get the store accessor. And uh, then we could maybe, let's do a console read here. So we have to press something to have a better, better visual from that. And then we could say, maybe uh, we get the store, store accessor. Then we get the entity store. And uh, you can see here's a snapshot. That's actually actually the snapshot that we take in persistence and just, just save. Each snapshot um, it contains the whole data set that we have in, the, in our store. Meaning you just can uh, save this, this snapshot, it's thread safe. It's uh, immutable, you can just save that. And uh, when we create a new snapshot, they are put on top of each other. So you can do time, time travels and things like that. But that's another story. So in our case, we just wanna uh, take the entity store and update it. So we have this update method here. And then we have this edit session here, let's call it S. 
And this uh, method, you could uh, say this update will create a new snapshot. And a snapshot is just a diff. So it doesn't create all the, uh, it doesn't copy all the entities, just the changed ones. Um, and then maybe we take one of these IDs here and we say, we change Mycroft locally. So we say we have an entity ID and this entity ID is actually uh, from the type session with this uh, ID value, let's say ID. Then we get, and this current snapshot that we have in our edit session is actually the new snapshot. It's at the moment mutable. So we can grab from that the entity that we want to change. So we know that it exists, but we still can be cautious. So we take the entity ID here. Uh, we take the entity, what is it? A session entity. entity. And it's an out. And then we manipulate it. In this instance, I decided, and we have a lot of generation uh, generator options here. Um, sorry, did I do a point in here? No, that's just a bug. Okay, uh, I decided that I want entities rendered as records, and that's cool because in .NET five, I have a .NET five application here. I can uh, work much better with with immutable data with um, with records. So I now can say uh, set entity, uh, this entity. So I replace this entity with a new version. And this new version is called, is this entity. And then we have this new wither syntax in .NET 5, where I can say, I want this original entity with um, the title changed to, we actually want to change it back. Or maybe let's create a new title. I want my own local title. Okay, so this is a local change now. It's not done to the backend, but uh, you could do that, uh, store local data on the store, manipulate data locally while you're on the airplane or have bad reception and then replay that to the backend later. So you can see here, we have still that data, data in the backend hasn't changed. Um, now we hit enter. We changed now our data after the, the HTTP call, we changed it locally here. So the subscribe is again called and reprints our new data set, which actually now has my local title in there. Okay, that's the last demo. You survived a lot of content. I hope you got some out of it. Uh, although it was a lot of con uh, concepts. We started building actually a hot uh, strawberry shake a year ago. And uh, we took a lot of concepts in from the JavaScript from, from, from .NET and uh, married them. And now with source generators, you have the full power of the .NET compiler compiling GraphQL for you into C Sharp. And then we have IntelliSense. I, I showed you from, from Visual Studio. We are actually at the moment, Visual Studio is still a preview, but uh, you saw it in, in Visual Studio Code, in Rider, in uh, Visual Studio for Windows preview. Then until, until uh, June, we will finish that preview off. It will finalize until June. And we are also bringing it to Visual Studio for Mac. And then every .NET platform has, has GraphQL as a first class citizen in there. So what are the takeaways here? You actually can iterate much faster with GraphQL and, uh, uh, and Blazor because uh, you, you're using pure.net. That's your home, your home territory. You're, you're just iterating there. Uh, and you're, you don't have to always change your backend. I never changed my backend in this talk. I did, didn't have to go to the backend change it because I exposed my data graph once um, with hot chocolate in the backend, and now I can use it. I pick and choose what data I need from that. And that enables me as a front-end developer to really iterate much faster. I, I'm not blocked in my pace. Maybe I sometimes need uh, completely new data. So the data graph 
gets new uh, all new data. But I can pick what I need at what moment in time. Uh, data is fetched more efficiently because I just fetch what I need. And we have all those reactive components that I, in many cases, don't have to write a single line of code. I just essentially write a bit markup, define how I uh, structure my, my business components. And I'm not concerned with all the, the fetching, uh, fetching of data. And the state management really enables me to build completely new um, applications that interact where components update automatically. I don't have to write all this code that goes to each component, updates the data there. It's, it's done um, automatically for you. Also things like uh, offline applications, very simple to do. You saw it's, it's essentially two lines of code and then you have an op offline application. So GraphQL and Blazor and also Summary, also new the new summary platform totally enables you with that to write complete new experiences, much more interactive applications. And it is, this is what made GraphQL so great in the uh, JavaScript realm. As I said, we would uh, love a few stars. And also there is, um, there is uh, our webpage where you have uh, documentation about what I uh, showed you. Um, you can go to our webpage, uh, read into it, read into also Hot Chocolate and the other tools. Um, and we are putting more and more tools um, every release. So it's it's really growing this platform. And we now have a end-to-end -end user experience from, from client to server to IDE tooling. Everything is built in open source. So there's no cost included. It's a MIT license, so you even can fork stuff of this. 